Good morning. It's so great to see you all. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Jane. Welcome to Grace Community Church. We are so thankful that you're here. And uh, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a real good day. So what do I need to tell you? Oh, we need to also um, turn, because I want to say hello, love, and go Chiefs to Miss Jean. But would you all please turn and wave and blow kisses and just say hello to all of our online friends. We love them. Sherry, if you're watching. Okay. So, there you go. If you're new, you have, we have these cards. Would you please fill one out? It's a keep in touch card. Um, if you haven't filled one out, would you please do that? We would love to just get to know you, and well, we won't harass you, I promise. We would just love to just get to know you and, and just make you feel welcome and loved. And this is such a great, you don't even know how great these people are. You, they are so great. So please, if you would, please do that. Fill that out for us. Okay, baby bottles. I didn't grab one. We have, babe, is there one under here? Hooray, looky there. If you have not grabbed a baby bottle bank and you would love to do this, please, for Choices, we partner with Choices Pregnancy Center. You just throw your change in here um, and then bring them back on, is it the, what day is it, Sherry? 19th? The 19th, they need to come back. And then, no, wrong. Okay, false. We have a change. It's the 26th because we handed them out later. So Cliff and I are going to be giving $5. Is that what we said? Five bucks for every and now you know why I work. <laughs> Woohoo! $5 for every bottle, please. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. We would love to do that. Um, if you, we have Presbytery here this week. That's a big deal. They're going to be so happy when it's 70, especially those of them that come from Montana. Um, so anyways, if you have some fruit on your fruit trees and you would love to share it, bring it in if you wouldn't mind during the week and we'll have that for our sweet Presbytery people and they can be jealous. Okay. Everyone is invited. Everyone is invited to join us on February the 4th at 9 a.m. for a continental breakfast featuring Dr. James Whitford. This, I love this man. Um, he will be speaking on the subject of real compassion, real results, moving people from poverty and government dependence to a place of faith, flourishing, and personal responsibility. The work he has done is amazing. Cliff and I worked with him a long time in Joplin, and he is just great. So if you would sign up in the Sheep Gate, please, to let us know you're coming. Um, you will really enjoy him. Okay, wait, there's one more thing I'm supposed to say. Okay, would you be willing to come and serve and help clean up for the Presbytery dinner on Thursday, February 2nd. We need about two to three people to help do that. If you would be willing, there is a different sign-up for that out in the Sheep Gate. So we would love to have you come and, and do that as well. I think, I think that's everything. So if you would please stand if you're able and welcome. We have, I see a lot of new faces. So welcome these new people and love them and say hey.
stay standing if you can. Please stay standing if you're able to do that. Okay, let's focus our hearts for our call to worship. You are holy, O you who are enthroned on the praises of Israel. You are, you are of purer eyes than to see evil. Neither may evil dwell within you. You are kind in all your works, and holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Amen. Amen. I've got all my itinerary right here. Good morning to everyone. It's such a beautiful day. And... <laughs> <laughs> I brought my hymnal, and it's the same hymnal as you all have out there, but you might see that it's about ready to just fall apart completely. Uh, the pages are, you know, bendable. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had this Bible for, you know, ever and ever. And there are eight, more than 800 hymns in this Bible and in your Bibles. Hymn, hymn, book. hymn book. I shouldn't say Bibles. I should say hymnals. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought about it, and I thought about all of the churches that have hymnals and all of God's music that is in those hymnals. And I thought, you know, this goes back hundreds of years. What if at some time, and I even hate to say it, some government should decide we do not need hymnals. We do not need church. And it could happen, folks. It could happen. Not in my time, I hope, or even in yours. But who knows? And the Lord, we know, is in this. And I don't want to be <laughs> a giver of gloom and doom right now. So that's all I'm going to say about that. And we're going to open our songs with He <laughs> Has Made Me Glad. One of my favorite hymnals comes from here. you sit down, please. <coughs> One of my favorite hymns, How Great Thou Art. Let's sing it together. See 
It is good to see you all today. Thank you for those of you who loaned tools to our uh, Trail Life boys. Uh, are, did you realize that our Trail Life boys moved 41 tons of granite yesterday? Do we have any pictures to that effect? We don't. We don't? Oh, it didn't happen. Oh, you'll have to crawl through glass for a mile on that one. No. They, it was great. I mean, we saw all ages of the spectrum. It was fabulous, and the boys were just on the move. And so uh, if you loaned tools for that activity, please, you can pick them up when you go out the doors. Main doors are on the right-hand side of the front of the building, and uh, you can get your stuff there, but thank you for that. Also, um, you know, we have a lot of people around here who do, do a lot of hard work, and, and we're not one of those... 80% of the, or 20% of the people do 80% of the work churches. We got a lot higher percentage of people who are putting in a lot of hours and a lot of heart and a lot of time. And I really, really deeply appreciate it. And so today we are uh, recognizing several people, uh, two people who are leaving uh, the session. That's where what's our elders are known as the session. And um, we have one who's actually not leaving entirely because she's going to be our clerk of session. And we have another who is just put in year after year after year. So I'd like to invite uh, Patty French and Merv Olson to come on down front for a moment. Come up here, please. So, Merv... We know how much you have spent uh, time working on the building that we have here. 
And uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a long, how many years have you served? About nine and a half. About nine and a half. I think he took an extension. So Merv, we want to thank you for all the years you've put in, all the service that you've given to this church as an elder, as a spiritual leader of this church. Thank you. This is a replica of the temple. And uh, so it's very appropriate. It's all up to the Lord. Amen. 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 Patty French, I don't know how much you know this lady does. She does a lot. And I can't even go over it all now because it would take way too long. But Patty, Patty is my go-to person for just about anything that comes up and hits me in the face, which is a lot of stuff. And um, she's, she's great at organizing. She's worked on the stewardship and finance team. She's been our treasurer. She's... Uh, she's now in the office doing financials, um, and, and of course she's going to continue as clerk of session. And the reason I got these shofars was because I, Patty is always, well, she's not blowing her own horn. She's blowing the horn that says, hey, we've got something to look after here. Hey, everybody over here. Hey, we've got to go do this. And usually she's the first one there to serve. So we want to thank you, Patty French, and we're grateful for you. And stay right here. And there are two more people, or four more people I'd like to invite forward who have served as deacons. Will the Rognesses please come up? Are the Adams here? Did I see? Are the Adams here? Oh, okay. So we'll come on down, Dick, Dick and Marie Rognes. Rogueness. Say that with me. Rogueness. Everybody wants to pronounce it differently. <laughs> Dick and Marie have served so faithfully uh, for many years as deacon, and uh, they, they oversee a care group and all this, this good stuff, and they're all heart and uh, I just love the way they have served. Even when they go away as snowbirds, they have served faithfully. And it's all wrapped up so nicely. But uh, in this are two Jerusalem candles that we wanted you to have because they represent the light and love of Christ that you've shown to so many people. So thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's take, uh, I, I do want to draw, you. oh, you can stay up here. All right, they're already halfway down. I, but, you know, I, Randy Bice, after many years, has uh, rolled off session, but because of some health issues with D Donna, wasn't able to make it here today. And so, um, you know, we, we will recognize him at a later time. But this is, this is glorious stuff. By the way, I don't know if you're hot. I'm, would somebody op crack open those two doors in the, er, in the fellowship area? Get a little air going in here. I'm going to start preaching, and the hot air is going to flow, baby. <laughs> so beware. There, um, you all can set those down. I'm going to have you stay up here. And uh, I want to read some scriptures, because Jesus did say that the servant of all is the greatest of all. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And when we think of leadership, a lot of times we think, who's going to be first? Who's going to be the the big pig at the trough or whatever. That's the way our government officials seem to look at it. And we need to, in the church, represent something very different, don't we? We need to represent the servant nature of leadership. And uh, we read about this uh, with Jesus. In chapter 13 of John, verse 3, uh, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. That was a very humbling thing. To wash someone's feet was the lowest job in any household. And I know that our elders who currently serve, have served, will serve, will take the towel and will serve 
as Christ served in this congregation. So I want to I want to invite up those people who will be serving as elders, and um, we have three for elders, but one thankfully chose not to share his sickness with us today. I think he's got Ebola or something. No, I know it's not nothing like that. Um, but that's what we all think anymore, isn't it? Oh, it's the worst. Well, I'd like to invite. Uh, well, Lenny Devine isn't here today, but Mark Brown, will you come forward, please? And Steve Pates, will you come forward? These two men have accepted the call to serve as elder, and we have five women who have accepted the call to serve as deacon. Please come up here. And while they're I'm going to name these names, and, and when the deacons come up, I'm also going to ask all who are currently serving as elder and deacon to come forward and stand behind our friends. So those, uh, those women who have been called as deacons, uh, Barbara Brown, Barbara Devine, uh, Linda Wyan, Diane Wilton, um, who did I miss? Who did I miss? Pates. How could I miss Ginny Pates? Come on down, Ginny Pates. So would you all come up and would... Also, those who are currently serving as elders and deacons, come forward, please. Um, make sure they get around there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. This is... This is a little more chaotic than I had planned today. <laughs> okay, Betty, you're going to need to stand behind them since you're serving currently. Please and thank you. All right. Are we good? All right. You know, none of these people have been called to this position because they looked at their feet first or they thought, oh, okay, if nobody else will do it. No, no, no. These are people who are serving because God has called them and, they, and, and the Lord made it clear to our nominating team and, uh, and to our congregation, as you know, we voted to uh, approve these friends. And um, it, there may yet be some of their testimonies listed out in the sheep gate, the entryway. And uh, you may want to look at those to get to know these friends a little more. Well, I'd like to just take a moment to remind you of the, this is the very briefest of descriptions of these positions. The position of ruling elder, uh, Mark and Steve. The role of ruling elder is that of spiritual leader who under the guidance of scripture and the common purpose of Grace Community Church collectively with other elders seeks to represent the mind of Christ in leading this congregation. It is the duty of deacons, first of all, to minister to those who are in need, to the sick, to the friendless, and to anyone who may be in distress. They shall assume such other duties as may be delegated to them from time to time by the session. That's my favorite line. <laughs> well, friends, there are a number of questions that we want to ask of these People, and then I'm going to ask you a question, and I will ask you at that point to stand and uh, join us. So uh, there are several questions for all of you and a couple at the very end that are just specific to, to elder and specific to deacon. So dear friends, do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, do you? Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God, totally trustworthy, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, and supreme, final, and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you? 
You can be a little more robust about this, friends. Let's not be timid. <laughs> Do you sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scripture? Do you? Yes, I do. Better. Do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with the system of doctrine as taught in the scriptures and contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church, you will on your own initiative make known to your church session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Will you? Do you? Do you affirm and adopt the essentials of our faith without exception? Do you subscribe to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? Do you? Yes. Do you promise subjection to your fellow presbyters in the Lord? Yes. 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 Have you been induced, as far as you know, in, in your heart to seek the office of holy ministry uh, from love to God and a sincere desire to promote his glory in the gospel of his Son? Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise to you on that account? Yes. Yes. Elders, will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as ruling elder, whether personal or relative, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of, go of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before this congregation of which you which God made you an officer will you yes i will are you now willing to take responsibility in the life of this congregation as a ruling elder and will you seek to discharge your duties relying upon the grace of God in such a way that the entire church of Jesus Christ will be blessed will you yes yes i will and now deacons Will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as deacon, whether personal or relative, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before this congregation of which God has made you an officer? Will you? Are you now willing to take responsibility in the life of this congregation as a deacon? And will you seek to discharge your duties, relying upon the grace of God in such a way that the entire church of Jesus Christ will be blessed? Will you? Yes. And dear friends, I ask you to rise now. Do we, the covenant partners of this congregation, accept these dear friends as elders chosen by God through voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ according to the word of God and the constitution of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Do we? we do. do we agree to pray for, to encourage, to respect, and to, uh, I've already said encourage, and to follow these dear friends as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. Do we agree? We do. Will you stretch out your hands, please, towards these friends and those who are currently serving? Will you lay hands, and Merv, will you lay hands on these friends? And I've asked if Bud will pray for us, so Bud, I'm going to ask if you'll go to the very front. Surely. I'll pray first for the Board of Session, the elders, and secondly for the Board of Deacons. And at the conclusion of the prayer for the deacons, I'll ask you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Shall we pray? Set apart, O Lord, these your servants to the work wherein they have been called by the voice of this congregation. And do them plenteously with your heavenly wisdom. Grant them that grace that they may be good people, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, ruling in the fear of God. Give them that favor and influence with the people which come from following Christ. So fill them with Christ's spirit that they may lead this congregation in Christ's service. Make them faithful unto death and when the chief shepherd shall appear, may they receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away in Jesus' name. 
Set apart, O Lord, and consecrate these your servants to the office of deacon. Give them your spirit of compassion for human needs. Inspire them with devotion to the church. Guide and sustain them in all their service until their work on earth is done. And bestow upon them the great rewards of your heavenly kingdom. Now hear us as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Your friends, you may be seated, but let's give these friends a round of applause. Welcome to leadership. You may be seated. Pastor Cliff has asked that I read only the first seven verses of chapter three in Genesis today because we're going to deal only with the fall of humankind into sin and not with the predictions of the re resurrection and the redemption of our ways from sinful means and from the power of sin. This is Genesis chapter 3, the story of the fall of humankind into sin. And remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were all of humankind. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Here ends the story of the fall. Remember... It wasn't the apple on the tree caused all the problem in the Garden of Eden. It was the pear on the ground. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Thus saith the Lord, the sermon is ended. <laughs> I, I had to take the robe off, friends. Otherwise, I'd be passing out up here. Thank you for cracking open those doors. If you get a little too chilly, feel free to get up and close those doors. But um, we're going to heat up things here. Lord, we pray now that uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in thy sight, O oh, gracious Lord. Amen. Well, I, I really don't mean to shock you this morning, uh, but on Friday I realized, and it was after the bulletin was printed, that... I wasn't going to be able to do a five-point sermon today with all this other stuff going on, so I'm just doing the first point. Temptation. I was tempted to give those other points. Oh, but I'm a, I'm a man with a steel will of determination, so I'll refrain. It just sort of happened this way. You know, it's kind of a little humorous that this subject has come up well, on the day that we install new officers, isn't it? But, but maybe it's a good thing because we all know if we've heard any news over the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years that church leaders are not immune to temptation. Unlike your pastor, of course. Okay, if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn. In fact, one of the best sermons that I have ever heard on this subject was by a, a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Uh, Haddon Spurgeon Robinson, who at one point served as the president of my seminary, Gordon Conwell. And so I want to give him some credit this morning because uh, he's just a brilliant man. Um, and so I thank God for him. Mark Twain once said uh, that we are all like the moon. 
we have a dark side. Now, I know there are a few of you who are entirely sanctified, and I want to meet you afterwards because I've never met one before, but every one of us has this dark side. Deep down inside every human being, there is an inclination toward evil. Oh, click, that's so harsh. We're refined people. Yes, deep down inside of every person, there is an inclination towards evil. There's a fascination with the darkness of sin. Twenty years ago, I received a call from my cousin who was highly distressed and not happy at all. And as I listened to him, I was very shocked and saddened to hear that his pastor had had an affair with a church member. It was shocking because the pastor was and still is a very close friend of mine. I looked up to him as an older brother in the Lord. I looked up to him as a young pastor, as a mentor to, to me. I looked up to him uh, as, as a, a man who set the pace in faith and ministry. In fact, my cousin had been the chairman of the search committee that brought my friend to the church, and the reason they did was on my recommendation. Well, that was one of the reasons. My cousin said that this was so egregious and damaging to the church that they were going to have my friend removed from the pulpit. How sad. I, I felt like I let my friend down. I let my cousin down. I let the church down. I felt terrible that my friend who was and is a brilliant preacher with more degrees than most people, uh, he just in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, had risked his reputation, his education, his church, his marriage, his friendship with me, his family, his future, uh, on something which promised nothing but sorrow and heartache. Maybe you know someone like this. I found myself wrestling with all kinds of questions and emotions. What happens in a person's life? Who does that? What, what was it that caused him to turn his back on all that he had given his life to? I realized in that moment that I was actually asking those questions that weren't simply for him, but about myself. What is it that causes someone to mortgage everything to which they have given themselves on to, 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 to pay the high price of sin? Why would they mortgage their whole lives that way? What is it that lures us to destruction? It's a question we all face, isn't it? You're a Christian, so temptation is going to dog your path, probably has your whole life ever since you made a commitment to the Lord. That's usually when sin really starts to tempt us, okay? And, and trips us up, hurts us. Where do we usually fail? We usually fail in relationships, isn't that right? It's true. Temptation, at least succumbing to it, is highly destructive. And friends, I would say that when it comes to relationships, even those of us who are most mature in the Lord know how to screw it up somehow. So the question that we all have to face someplace in our lives is how does this tempter work? How does this tempter come to us? How does he destroy us. Here, here, early in the ancient record, we have one of the themes that's woven again and again and again throughout the scripture. It's the theme of sin. It's the destructive power that it brings into our lives. What we have in Genesis 3 is a case of study of temptation and as a case study what you want to do is to get rid of the independent variables to study the thing itself at least that's what dr robinson would say certainly as eve approached 
is approached by the tempter. There are many things that weren't true of her that might be true of us. Have you ever thought about that? Wow. I mean, I, I know as kids we probably, well, we probably all, all ask questions like, did uh, Adam and Eve have a belly button? Huh? I don't know. But there are things they didn't have. Probably not that either. For example, Eve has no poisoned blood in her veins. She doesn't have a heritage on which she can blame her sin. Eve comes as Adam did from the direct creation of God. And when God created Adam and Eve, God declared that the creation was very good. Unlike people today, she wasn't born with a sin nature. Now some of you are going, oh, oh, those cute little babies. Let me tell you what. How long does it take for a baby to, to, to sin? I'll let you measure that. I just know that when my daughter was six months old and I said, you don't touch that clicker, she had to touch the clicker. Isn't that the way that works? Oh, and on and on it goes. But it's just a little clicker and it's just a little baby. You know, David said, I was born into sin from my mother's womb, from my birth. And we all are. We're all born into a world that is sinful. And we've all inherited a nature from Adam and Eve. What's more? Adam and Eve live in a perfect environment, don't they? I mean, there's nothing as far as pollution in the air. Oh, my goodness, they're not worried about, you know, Climate change, oh my goodness, climate change, it's gonna, the fireball's going to get us. No, no, the freezing, never mind. There's no pollution in the atmosphere. There, 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 no pollution that would lead them away from God. She stands there in the morning of creation, a creature of great wonder. There's no sinful heritage, no environment, environmental problems. And we have a case study here of temptation. As we watch the way the tempter comes to Eve, we recognize that while this story comes to us out of the ancient past, it's as if the temptation that you may be facing, or you may have faced, or you will face in your home and with your neighbors and with your family members in your life, it's as if it was just like the very first temptation. The scene has changed, but let me tell you, the methodology has not changed. So how does Satan tempt us? As, as we read this story, one of the things that we'll discover is that when the tempter comes, he comes to us in disguise. He, the, the writer of Genesis says that the serpent was what? More crafty than all the wild animals the Lord had made. I gather that he's call, telling us that, that when the serpent came, he didn't come as a thing of ugliness. The scene happens before the curse. This happens before the serpent crawls on its belly out uh, upon the ground. There are no rattlers there to, to, to warn of an impending poison. No, there's nothing there that would have made Eve feel alarmed at all. So when Satan comes to you, he doesn't come as a coiled snake. He doesn't come with the roar of a lion. He doesn't come with a wail of a siren. He doesn't come waving a red flag. Satan just slides and slithers into your life, doesn't he? He comes and he seems almost like a comfortable old friend. There seems to be nothing about him that you would dread. The New Testament says that he comes as an angel of light, a minister of God. Oh, boy, that causes you to stop and pause. He sometimes even comes as a minister of righteousness. And one point that's quite clear is that when the enemy comes to attack you, dear friends, he always comes with a disguise. Uh, as Mesistopheles said in Faust, the people do not know the devil is there even when he has them by the throat. Watch the news, and you'll get what I'm saying. Not only is he disguised in his person, he's disguised in his purposes. And when he comes, he doesn't come to, say, to, to, to Eve, 
oh, Eve, I have come to tempt you. That's not what he says. What he does is to come for a religious discussion. He wants to talk theology. He doesn't want to talk about sin. He, he begins his temptation by saying, Did God really say that you mustn't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, you can't argue with that. I mean, Satan comes and says, Look, I, I just want to be sure that the idea God was trying to get across is, is exactly what I'm thinking. I mean, did he really say that you can't eat from any trees in the garden? I mean, see, he's a religious devil. That's what he is. Unfortunately, there are lots of religious devils out there, friends. That's why I always tell people, learn this book. Whoa, keep your markers in there too, but learn what's in this book for yourself. And that way you can test those of us who are called to positions of authority or those of us who have slithered up into a place of authority. So the devil doesn't come and knock on the door of your soul and say, pardon me, sir or ma'am, uh, give me a half hour of your life. I'd like to damn you to hell and destroy you. That's not the way he comes. He just wants to come and talk theology, theology, the study of God, you know. And, and he wants to be sure that he understands exactly what the Word of God says. It's, it's very possible, isn't it, to discuss biblical concepts in, to your peril? I've noticed this, not just with clergy types, not just with seminary types, but with church types. It's very possible to get into these kinds of discussions in which you talk about God in, in sort of an abstract way, like a mathematical formula, so that you can construct a theology that leads to the disobedience of God. And you're big on grace, right? We're all big on grace. Everybody here like grace? I like grace. Yeah. One person raised their hand. That was pitiful. <laughs> We're all big on Christian liberty, don't You know, we love that liberty. I mean, you like to sin. God likes to forgive. It's a great arrangement. You can do anything you want, anytime you want, with anyone you want. No restrictions. I mean, really, there are no hang-ups. You're free. You know that all about this God's grace business. Every Christian who's ever turned liberty into license has done it on a theological ground you can get to the place where you decide oh even when i sin god's grace abounds isn't it wonderful that i'm serving god's grace because i show his forgiveness see now this is how it works you can be big on god's sovereignty God is sovereign over the affairs of men and nations. God's eye isn't only over history. His hand is on history. His hand is upon your life. And before long, God is so sovereign that you no longer have responsibility. That's what double predestination does for those of you who are really theologically minded and study that kind of stuff. It's fatalism. After all, in a sense, all the world is a stage, all the men and women merely players. God maps out the action. God plans the dialogue. You go through the paces, but it's all of God, even your sin. And out of that discussion, you come away finding good, sound reasons for disobeying God all because you want to discuss theology with the wrong motive. Another thing that Satan does in his conversation, this discussion about God, is, is to focus Eve's attention on that single tree in the center of the garden. He says, it seems inconceivable to me a thing that, that God wouldn't let you have any of these trees. And now Eve comes to to God's defense. 
She's a, a witness for God. She says, no, 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 we can eat of all the trees of the garden, but of that one tree there in the, in, in the middle, uh, we can't eat from that. We can't even touch that tree. See, God didn't say that last part, did he? He, he didn't say anything about touching. But, but, but one of the things people do in defending God is to become more righteous than God to become stricter than God. I mean, this is one of the problems of those who are more conservative. I would identify with that. Uh, those of us who are more uh, determined to look to God's word as our final authority for matters in faith and practice. And so this is one of our sins. We want to be like the Pharisees and build an extra hedge. Well, that was one of the things that the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ couldn't stand, couldn't abide by. Well, they, what happens is we, we not only look at God's commands, but we think that we're holier if we go beyond God's commands. And there's destruction in that, dear friends. Eve makes it a, a point to say, you know, we can't taste it. We're not allowed to taste it. We can't even touch it. And, and what Satan has done, of course, is to focus her mind what? On all of the trees of the garden? Uh-uh-uh. He was focusing her mind on the clicker. He was focusing her mind on that one thing that she wasn't supposed to eat of. Sometimes you, you wonder how people could turn their backs on all the good things that God has given us, all the blessings that have been poured into our lives. And we just... Throw them away for a single sin in our lives. I mean, and the, and, and, and the answer is that they, we really haven't seen the things that God has given us as blessings. We might have sort of in passing acknowledged them, but ultimately if we understood them as blessings, we wouldn't turn away from them. See, Satan shifts the focus, and that's the one thing that you so desperate, you want so desperately that you'll do anything to get it. It becomes the focus of your life. And everything else God does, you tend to kind of put in the back seat of a very long bus. So Satan comes in a disguise. He conceals who he is and what he wants to do. The second thing that you discover is that in his attack, he attacks God's word. Eve responds, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. And Satan does what? He throws back his head and... <laughs> that's better. Surely, you don't believe that, do you? That you will surely die oh come now it's a bit of fruit surely die that's just a bit of exaggeration on god's part because he's using it to get your attention but he doesn't mean it surely die come now you're more sophisticated than that eve you're too aware to believe that the God who gave you this marvelous garden and all these trees and this bountiful fruit is going to be excited about your taking that one little piece of fruit. Surely you will die? <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? God certainly doesn't mean it. I can assure you of that. How easily we fall into this trap, how easily we can come to believe totally in the Bible as God's authoritative, inerrant word, but on some particular issue that's an issue between me and God, oh, ho, ho, ho. I have my own interpretation. Mm. He doesn't really mean it when he says, you will surely die. For thousands of years and with billions of people, Satan has repeated this lie over and over and over again. 
It's the idea that uh, many that you find in many modern books and plays where the author is able to so move the plot that people live in deep disobedience to God, but somehow in the end they come out and everything's turned out well. It's the theme of modern movies in which characters live a life of rebellion against God, but they live happily ever after. It's the word from the, the sponsor in television. Remember some years ago we, we had that, that commercial out for my sin. Remember that? The fragrance that some huckster on uh, Madison Avenue named for us. Uh, it said on the label, here is a fragrance that's so alluring, so charming, so exciting, so harmless, you can call it my sin. And that fragrance is a stench in the nostrils of God. And what are we doing today? What did they do? On, they just put a satanic statue up on one of the courthouses in New York City. They've had the, the, the statues to Satan in the courthouse at the same time uh, 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 that we celebrate Christmas. They, 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 they have uh, after-school clubs, sat Satan after-school clubs now throughout our country. Wow. He really did become comfort a comfortable friend, didn't he? And how do you feel about these warnings about disobedience that fill the Bible? How do you feel about the warnings? Does God really mean it when he says that they who live after the flesh shall die? Does God really mean it when he says in Galatians 6, 8, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction? Does God really mean it when he says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever a man sows, so shall he reap? Does God mean it when he says that the, the eye of the Lord is against the wicked? Does God mean it when he says he shall judge his people? Does God mean it when he says fornicators and adulterers God will judge? That wouldn't be any of us. How do you feel about this? How does... I mean, does God mean it when he says things like this? God is serious, dear friends, about sin because God is serious about you and you and you and even you people over here and me. He's serious about us. God is serious about sin because God loves you and because God knows the devastation that sin can, can have in your life and your relationships and your character and your witness. God is serious about sin as a loving parent is serious about fire and warns a child about it, knowing that it can maim that child for life, destroy the home that that child lives in, and do untold damage. But how do you feel about it? Does God mean it when he says those things? Not only does God, does Satan attack God's word, but he goes deeper and he attacks God's character, which lies behind his word. For the serpent said to the woman in verse 5, For God knows that when you eat of that tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. This is a great thing, right? What Satan's doing is attacking God's goodness here. What he's saying is, you know why God gave you that command? He, it's because he wants to spoil your fun. The, the reason he gave you that command is that he wants to keep a tight leash on you. He doesn't want you to be free. He doesn't want you to experience the abundant life. He wants you to deny your pleasures. He wants to show that he's in control. He wants to keep you down. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you to have any excitement that life can offer people. He knows that when you eat of this fruit, you'll be like him. And you'll know good and evil too. You'll have experiences, you know, you'll have in no other way. God's got an ulterior motive here, Adam and Eve. He's got a hidden agenda. It's one of evil. Once the well is poisoned, all of the water is destroyed. For example, probably one of the most beautiful confessions of love and faith in, in, the, in the Bible is the confession of, that Ruth makes to Naomi. And, and uh, she says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. 
where you go, I will follow, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. It's beautiful. But suppose someone came to Naomi and said to her, Naomi, come on, wise up. Ruth's a gold digger. She's a manipulator. What Ruth really wants, this uh, Moabite is, is to get back into Israel to marry a wealthy Jew, and she knows her passport home is with you. She'll tell you just about anything that you want to hear just to get a free pass back to Israel. Now, if Naomi believes that, then the well is poisoned, and every good thing Ruth does, Naomi will suspect. Every kind word that Ruth will speak, Naomi will reject. When you poison the well, all of the water is poisoned. When you come to the place where you doubt God's word because you really doubt God's goodness, then Satan's done his job. <laughs> I had to do that. But how easily we do that. All of us have, have served the prince of darkness and lived in his realm, all of us apart from Christ. And when we come to the kingdom of God's Son, we, we have a way of bringing our doubts and suspicions with us. Have you noticed that? Something happens in your life that's difficult and you find yourself asking, well, why? And that question marks like a dagger pointed right at the heart of God. How easily we begin to, to suspect that what happens in this particular case in our life is really a demonstration of, that God is against us. Oh, I've heard that from people who claim to be believers. It's striking to me. I mean, we suffer such a, a twisted will that even the, when good things happen to us, we doubt God's goodness. Something marvelous comes into your life, something unexpected, and you're delighted. And then all at once, there's a shadow that cr crosses your mind that be before long, all this is going to be taken away. That God really doesn't want me to enjoy the expansion of his goodness into my life. Uh, just as I get to enjoy it, he's going to snatch it back like some cruel, sadistic parent. So we knock on wood and we smash at the heart of God. When you doubt God's goodness, you'll doubt his word. You'll see God is re as, as restricting you, as holding you back. And the work of temptation is done. And so, dear friends, the writer tells us that at that moment, in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desiring for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. It now becomes pleasing to the eye. It becomes desirable because now she's listened to the lie of the tempter and her senses take control. You fill up my senses. <laughs> See, when you get God out of your life, when you come to, the, to question God's word and God's goodness and suddenly your senses come alive to what is evil and what was once out of bounds to you becomes now the thing that you desire and often the things that will destroy you the most. Piece of fruit? Someone might say that. Surely not a piece of fruit. You're not going to tell me that Eve sinned with a piece of fruit in a fruit orchard? <laughs> You're not going to tell me that that's why Adam sinned and that's why murder came into the family, which was the very next sin. You're not going to tell me that a piece of fruit damned the human race. No, not a piece of fruit. A disobedience to God's word. A distrust of God's character. The fruit is out there on the periphery. The sin is at the center. Whenever you come to deny or doubt the goodness of God, then at that point, in, that is the point in which you struggle in your soul and you'll come to deny his word. If Satan had come to Eve in that early morning and said, Oh, look, Eve, baby, sign this little paper <laughs> sign this paper that says that you'll be done with this 
God. She never would have signed it if, if that's the way he came. When Satan comes, he never comes dragging the chains that are going to confine us. He comes bringing the crown that will ennoble us. He comes offering us pleasure, expansiveness, money, popularity, freedom, enjoyment, and the biggest house in Sun City Grand. Oh, I had to say it. I had to go there. In fact, he never really says that there are any consequences at all, just that we all fill, that, that we'll all fill the desires of our hearts. He, he's going to fill them up. And it's there that we are destroyed. That's the lesson. The temptations that destroy us strike at the heart of God, at God's integrity, at God's goodness. And when we deny his goodness, we reject his word. When we reject his word, we do so at our peril. And so darkness descends upon the stage of the world in verse 7. We find our two main actors, Adam and Eve, no longer wa walking in joy and confidence and freedom before the Lord. Instead, they are naked. Well, before they were naked and not ashamed. And now they are naked and they are very much ashamed. And they are cowering behind fig leaves that they've sewn together. Their rebellious doubt and disobedience has driven them into darkness and fear. They're separated from God. And as the curtain falls, we're left to wonder if there's any hope for Adam and Eve. Is there any hope for humanity? And guess what, friends? Tune in next time because we'll find out in our next message from Genesis that God's got an amazing rescue plan. But as we close this morning, I would ask you to hear me well. I do not come to you this morning to give you some sort of uptight religion. Christianity isn't mere morality. It isn't a matter of toeing the line or keeping the rules. You see, being made in the image of God means that we were made for better things. Christianity is about a relationship with a God who loves you so much that he gave you his son. And every gift from God is good and perfect. As we said a couple of weeks ago, you were made for his arms. You were made for the dance. You were made to be brought into a very, very, very deep, close, personal relationship with him to give him joy and to sense your, in yourself his delight, to give him praise and to sense his, he, that he's delighted and, to, uh, and, and, and that he affirms you and that he loves you. He wants you to sense and experience and feel that love. That's what you were called for. That's what you were made for. That's what we need to be human. But we sin and we fall when we doubt God's goodness and disobey his word. So I want to encourage you today. We've, a number of us have taken up the challenge to read through the Bible in a year. Do it. Spend time in this word daily. Spend time meditating on it. Sometimes it's hard to understand. Sometimes we don't get how all the pieces fit together. But guess what? The more you study it, the more you get. And anything that's hard, any, any hard reading is usually worth reading. Okay, maybe not chemistry books. But um, that's a different subject. As Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 encourages us, I want you to remember these words. You might even memorize them. In fact, you can say these with me. So I'm going to repeat a phrase. Repeat this phrase by phrase. Trust in the Lord, in the Lord. With, all with all your heart and not in your own understanding. In, your own understanding. in all your ways, in all your ways. Acknowledge, him, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. It's a daily thing. It's a minute-by-minute -minute thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing. It's a freeing thing. Amen? Thank you for being so patient today. I hope and pray that God's Word has been a blessing to your heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your good word. Thank you for your good motives behind your love. May we give ourselves 
to you, to your will, and to your way, and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. The majesty and glory of your name, let's sing about it. So beautiful. You are so beautiful. I feel a song coming up. <laughs> I hope that you'll remember to sign up for the breakfast next week. With a 23% increase in poverty in our state this last year, and with us being the fourth state in the country for teens living on the street, the most teens living on the street. I hope you'll join us for my friend James Whitford, 9 o'clock next Saturday morning. I want you to know, having spent the better part of a year working with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India, that I've never met a more intelligent, more dedicated, more faithful man than James Whitford. So I hope that you'll come and, and join us for that. He's a wonderful man, and he's an excellent, excellent speaker. And now, receive these words that you've heard before from Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Go there, therefore, therefore, dear friends, as ones much beloved by God, of one who rejoices in forgiveness of sin, of one who will receive you as you are but won't leave you as you are. Go, therefore, dear friends, with that kind of confidence and that kind of joy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.